Hello and welcome to our Wednesday webinar from the IEA Clean Call Centre. My name is Benedicta and I'm part of the communications team here. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports, which are available from our website www.iea-call.org. Residents of member countries and employees of sponsoring organisations can download our reports at no charge after a one-off registration. The subject for today's webinar is fossil fuel-based energy storage technologies, presented by Dr. Chen Su. Over to you, Chen. Thank you, Benedict, for the introduction. Welcome to everyone, and thank you for tuning in to today's webinar on fossil fuel-based energy storage technologies. This is the outline of today's webinar. As we know, to fight the climate change, many countries have set mid- and long-term targets for renewable power generation and the CO2 emissions reduction. As variable renewable energy penetration increases, energy storage at fossil power generation sites may become necessary to enable the successful development of a resilient and flexible electricity network. I will begin with a discussion of the need and opportunity for energy storage. I will then look at the current deployment and the future market outlook of energy storage systems. This is followed by a review of commercial and emerging grid scale energy storage technologies. In many countries, coal power plants are often operating at a 50, around 50% capacity. Energy storage provides the opportunity to take advantage of this underutilized capacity. The energy storage system can store the excess electricity generated until it is needed by the grid. By pairing with energy storage, coal power plants can operate continuously at or close to its full capacity and therefore higher efficiency. Later in the webinar, the potential to integrate storage systems with coal power plants is explored and the three integration solutions are compared. Finally, I will wrap up my talk with the key findings. Towards the end of this webinar, I'll take your questions. There is a question box and you are welcome to submit your questions and the comments at any time during the talk and I will answer them at the end. A key objective of grid operators is to keep the system reliable and stable, ensuring the instantaneous and consistent balance of supply and demand of electricity. In a power system with no variable renewable energy in feed, conventional power plants serve more, more predictable demand based on the load curve seen here on the left. When the system adopts a high share of variable renewable energy, conventional plants need to operate flexibly to serve the load not covered by renewable energy. That is the residue load curve shown on the right here. As high penetration of intermittent wind and solar power introduces variability and uncertainty to the system, the same system becomes more volatile and therefore challenging to balance. The challenges of power system operations in managing increasing variability are illustrated in the California dark chart shown in the figure on the left. It clearly shows how the morning and the evening runs have been exacerbated by the increase in solar and the wind power. For example, the total installed capacity in California 
increased from 1.2 gigawatts solar power and 5 gigawatts of wind in 2012 to 10 gigawatts solar and 5.7 gigawatts wind in 2016. As a consequence, the ramp needed changed from around 3 gigawatts to around 11 gigawatts in the same period. In the absence of sufficient large-scale energy storage capacity, conventional power plants are increasingly subjected to load following and the cyclic operation to deliver greatly varying output to enable the grid to meet the load requirement at all times. As most existing coal power plants are base load units that are not designed for flexible load following operation, nor for being switched on and off frequently. Deviation from design operating condition decreases plant efficiency, increases fuel consumption and the emissions of air pollutants and CO2. Running the plants at a low capacity rate frequent stoppages and the rapid ramp rate causes extreme stress and the wear to the plant components, leading to a higher outage rate and the increased maintenance and the repair costs. Energy storage can help address the intermittency of solar and wind power by storing excess electricity and inject it back to the system when needed. It enables maximum integration of renewable energy where significantly reduce the need for power plants to provide flexibility. There has been a rapid growth in de deployment of grid scale energy storage in recent years, and the growth, the growth rate is expected to accelerate. But before I carry on, I'd like to just explain the uh, two terms will be often used in my following presentation. One is power capacity of the energy storage system. This is the maximum power output at a given time, and that it is expressed in megawatts or gigawatts of electric, electric power. The other one is the energy capacity of uh, energy storage. This is the total amount of energy that can be extracted from the energy storage device or system, and it is expressed in megawatts hours or gigawatt hours. Globally, the total energy storage capacity in 2020 was about 186 gigawatts. Despite the COVID-19 related slowdown in 2020, the USA saw a record breaking, uh, breaking growth in energy storage deployment, adding 1.5 gigawatts new capacity, which was almost entirely lithium ion battery systems. In China, the overall growth in energy storage has been strong since 2018. In 2020, China has installed 2.7 gigawatts energy storage systems and had a total cumulative installed energy storage capacity of 33.4 gigawatts. South Korea was the global leader in energy storage deployment, but the growth slowed since 2019. The battery storage system in South Korea expanded from 0.26 gigawatt hours in 2016 to nearly 4.8 gigawatt hours in 2018. Germany led the de deployment of grid scale applications in Europe with 54 megawatts capacity being installed in 2019. Australia had estimated energy storage of 1.2 gigawatt hours installed in 2020, bringing the cumulative capacity to over 2.7 gigawatt hours. 
Earlier this year, Australia announced a plan to build the world's biggest battery storage with a capacity of up to 1.2 gigawatts. Energy storage projects are also under de deploy, uh, development in countries such as India and Saudi Arabia. The grid storage market is expected to grow rapidly and the growth will be driven by the demand for battery storage systems. The global market for energy storage is projected to reach 546 billion US dollars in annual revenue in 2035, of which almost 112 billion US dollars would be for grid storage systems. Energy storage is not new. Batteries and the pumped hydropower have been used for over a century. So the new storage technologies are emerging in commercial market. Energy storage comprises a range of technologies. According to the form in which energy is stored, the technologies can be broadly divided into five categories, mechanical, electrochemical, chemical, electric, electrical, and the thermal energy storage. Mechanical storage systems store energy in the form of either potential or kinetic energy. Pumped hydro, compressed air, and the flywheels are the most common types of mechanical storage systems. Pumped hydro is the largest capacity and the most cost-effective form of grid-scale storage available for long-duration storage. It is a well-established and the currently dominant grid, grid storage technology, accounting for over 96% of global grid storage applications. It has high efficiency, long service life, but also has high capital cost, and its applications are limited to the availability of water resource and the geographically suitable sites. Compressed air energy storage, or CASE, is a mutual technology. In CASE, surplus electricity is used to run compressors which mechanically compress air. The compressed air is subsequently stored in underground space such as stored caverns and aquifers or in high pressure storage tanks. When electricity is needed, the compressed air is heated and directed through an expander or combustion turbine generator to produce electricity. Case with underground air storage can have large capacity and be cost effective, but its application is constrained by the availability of suitable storage cavens. It has long life, uh, long cycle life, but suffers low efficiency. Also, it needs a gas turbine to convert the stored energy back to electricity. Liquid air energy storage or lace works in the similar way to case but store air in the liquid form so it's more energy dense lace is the emerging technology and the two facilities are currently being developed in the uk and the usa a flywheel device comprises a massive rotating cylinder that usually spin at high speeds and is connected to a motor generator. The motor accelerates the flywheel to higher velocities and keeps the energy in the system in the form of rotational energy. When power is needed, the accelerated flywheel's rotor is slowed down by the motor, converting the inertia 
energy to electricity. Flywheel is a well-established short-duration energy storage technology. It has a rapid response time of a few milliseconds, high round trip efficiency, and can provide high power for short duration discharges. However, flywheels are expensive and have high rate of self-discharge. Electrical energy storage systems store electrical energy directly in the form of electric current or electric charges with a potential difference. Superconducting magnetic energy storage or SMES and the supercapacitors represent the two forms of electrical energy storage technology. They both have high energy density but low uh, they, they both have high power density but low energy density therefore are short duration energy storage technology they have a fast response response time of milliseconds high efficiency high cycle life but have high costs super supercapacitors are a mutual technology, while SMES are currently at an early demonstration phases. Thermal energy storage or TES system heat or cool a storage medium such as water, molten salt, and rocks to store thermal energy. TES can be further divided into sensible heat storage, latent heat storage, or chemical, uh, thermal chemical heat storage. Depending on the technology and the storage media used, medium used, the operating temperature of TES varies widely from lower than 80 degree to 200 degree Celsius for low temperature storage to higher than 600 degree for high temperature storage. Sensible heat, sensible heat storage, including hot water tanks used in homes and the district heating plants is by far the most commonly used type of TES. For electricity storage purposes, high temperature heat storage is required. The heat is recovered by the production of steam, which is used to drive a steam turbine generator. High temperature TES use using the molten salt are in commercial operation in solar thermal power plants. Also, several high temperature TES projects using solid medium such as rocks or uh, the um, concrete slabs are planned or under construction. Latent heat storage use phase changing materials to store thermal energy, while thermal chemical heat storage uses chemicals that absorb and release large amount of thermal energy when reacting. Both systems are currently under development. Electrochemical energy storage involves storing electricity in chemical form. The most notable example of uh, electrochemical energy storage is battery, which is one of the most traditional energy storage technologies. They can be classified into conventional and the flow batteries. According to the chemical composition based on the electrochemical reactions. There are many types of conventional batteries. Commercially available conventional batteries include sodium sulfur, lead acid, and the lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion batteries comprise a family of cell chemistries, differing in the composition of the cathode and the anode material. 
each type of lithium ion battery has distinct advantages and disadvantages in terms of <clears throat> performance, cost, safety, and other parameters. Overall, lithium ion batteries have higher energy density than all other batteries and a high rated voltage. They have, four, uh, they have high round trip efficiency, low self charge rate, the self discharge rate, long lifetime, low maintenance, and a light weight. However, they tend to gradually degrade in energy capacity over time. And they are also highly sensitive to temperature. The biggest issue, however, is the fire as a hazard. As a result, a battery management system and the safety measures are required. Lithium ion batteries are a mutual technology, which have seen significant cost reductions in recent years, but they are still expensive. Currently, lithium ion batteries dominate the grid scale battery market. Sodium sulfur batteries use the reaction of sodium oxidation and the sulfur reduction to cheap and easily available materials. Sodium sulfur batteries operate at high temperatures of 300 to 350 degree, and the system needs to be heated even when the battery is left in standby. Sodium sulfur batteries have a relatively high energy density, high efficiency, and a low, cell, a low rate of self-discharge. Compared to lithium ion batteries, sodium sulfur batteries have higher cycle life. The main disadvantages of sodium sulfur technology are the corrosive nature of the manufacturing materials and the need for, the need for constant heat input to maintain the required high operating temperature. Sodium sulfur batteries are a, com uh, are a commercial technology. Several large facilities with capacity of up to uh, 50 megawatts and a multi megawatts hours are in commercial operation in different countries for time shifting of power generation. Other sodium based high temperature batteries, such as sodium nickel chloride, also known as Debra can also be found in commercial market. Lead acid is one of the oldest and the most mutual battery technologies. Many of the early grid connected system were lead acid batteries. They have low cost, high efficiency and require minimal maintenance. Further, they can supply excellent pulsed power, have low energy leakage, easy to make, and there is a high recycling rate of the battery components. However, they have low energy density, short lifetime, and heavy weight. In flow batteries, one or both active material are in solution in the electrolyte, which is contained in external tanks. The energy capacity of the cell depends on the volume of electro electrolyte, where the power density is determined by the size and the shape of the electrodes. Therefore, the energy capacity and the power capacity of flow batteries can be varied independently. There are several types of flow batteries, including vanadium and zinc bromine redox batteries. Vanadium redox battery, or VRB, are one of the most mutual and the common flow batteries. VRB have a relatively high efficiency, long cycle life, and the minimum, minimum rate 
of self-discharge. They do not degrade with time, can withstand deep discharging, and have a low maintenance requirement. The downside to VRB is that the system is more complex than conventional batteries, and that their competitiveness is impacted by the recent rapid increase in the cost of vanadium and the higher operating costs. VRB are an emerging technology currently developing fast. Several small VRB facilities have been installed for grid storage. China is currently developing a 200 megawatts, 800 megawatt hours demo plant using VRB for peak shaving. Think bromine batteries are a relatively new technology and are in early stage of field deployment and demonstration trials. In general, batteries are capable of fast and the precise response to grid needs and can provide a range of ancillary service to the grid. Chemical storage system convert electric energy to chemical energy by production of a chemical, usually based on electrolysis technology. The chemical can later be used as a fuel to support a thermal load for power generation or for transportation. There are various pathways for chemical energy storage, such as production of hydrogen, methane, or synthetic gas. This kind of technology is often called power to gas or power to X. Water electrolysis for hydrogen production have been utilized commercially for over a century. There are mainly three types of water electrolyzers, alkaline, polymer electrolyte membranes, or PEM, and the solid oxide electrolyzers, in short, SOE. This slide compares the main technical characteristics of these three types of electrolyzers. Alkaline electrolyzers are the most mutual technology. They generally operate at ambient or moderate pressure and low temperatures. They have efficiency of up to 70%. PEM use solid form of electrolyte which enable them to operate at a high pressure and a high current densities, leading to a more compact, a compact design and thus reduced size, as well as the production of high purity hydrogen and a faster response to a variable power load. The operating load range of PEM can go from zero to 160% of design capacity. However, they have lower efficiency, shorter lifetime, and are more expensive compared to alkaline electrolyzers. SOE is the least developed technology. SOE operates at high temperature of up to 1000 degree and they use steam for elect electrolysis. It has the potential to become a low cost and a high efficiency electrolyzer. As it, use, it uses steam for electrolysis, this makes co-locating SOE with the thermal power plant advantages as waste heat from power generation can be used to evap uh, evaporate water for steam generation, improving energy efficiency. A major advantage of SOE is that they can operate in, in a reverse mode as a fuel cell, converting hydrogen back into electricity. Therefore, SOE can provide balancing services to the grid. Over last decade, there has been growing number of water electrolyzers installed for hydrogen production 
using renewable energy. The average unit size of installed electrolyzers has increased from tens or hundreds of kilowatts to multi-megawatts. PEM appears to be the preferred choice of technology. Energy storage can both release and absorb energy when needed, making it a unique power asset that can act as a generator or a storage system according to what is required. Coupling energy storage with a coal power plant can have several benefits such as better plant efficiency and environmental performance, increased reliability, lower operation and maintenance costs, extended the lifetime of power plants, and the improved plant eco economics. In addition, when carbon capture is required, the improved financial status of hybrid storage and power plants will enhance the economic viability of coal power generation with carbon capture. TES is well suited to integration for integration into the water steam cycle of a coal power plant. TES can be charged by extracting steam from different locations along the water steam loop to store the thermal energy during off-peak time. In this way, the electric, electric power output can be regulated while maintaining the constant heat duty of the boiler. During peak demand periods, the stored thermal energy can be injected back to the water steam loop to increase total power generation. Depending on the TES system selected and the temperature requirement of the TES, there are various ways to integrate TES with a coal power plant. Several integration concepts have been proposed and investigated, and the conceptual designs have been developed. Studies have shown that it is technically feasible to integrate TES into a coal power plant, and the, in the integrated TES and the coal power plant could have enhanced flexibility faster dynamic responses to load demand changes and perform better than a coal power plant in grid frequency services. Integration of a thermal power plant with a battery system is simpler than integrating a thermal power plant with TES because no modifications to the power generation process are required. The successful integration depends on the development of interfaces connecting the coal power plant and a, a battery pack with a control system that brings the two systems together to work harmoniously. Existing coal power plants retrofitted with battery storage systems are already in operation in China. In the hybrid battery coal power plant, the battery pack works as a supplement to the operation of generating units, enhancing the plant flexibility and the overall performance, as well as offering enhanced ancillary services, such as frequency regulation, spinning reserve without fuel burn higher peak power output, instant power to grid, and a faster startup. Similar to hybrid thermal power battery plants, combining power plant, coal power plant with water electrolyzers involve the integration of two mutual technologies and without the need to modify any power generation equipment. The effective connection of the two systems with a dynamic control system is the key to the successful integration. 
extensive R&D of nuclear power and electrolysis hybridization has been carried out in various countries. And the civil demonstration project of nuclear power electrolysis hybridization are currently under development in the USA. The development of coal power and electrolysis integration can capitalize on the knowledge and the experience gained from this R&D and the demonstration activities. Unlike the hybrid thermal power battery and the thermal power TES plant, the electro electrolyzers do not necessarily inject the stored energy back to the energy system, nor do they provide auxiliary services like batteries. The electrolyzers enhance the flexible generation of coal power plants by absorbing any surplus electricity whenever it is generated. The major advantages of hydrogen for energy storage are the length of time of storage that is possible and the, the bulk energy stored, uh, storage capacity. For large-scale stationary applications, the power and the energy capacity and the density, reaction time, charging, discharging time, efficiency, and the self-discharge rate of the energy storage system decides its suitability. The cyclability, useful life, and the cost determine the economic viability of a storage technology. In this study, the cost of three integration solutions, that is, retrofitting a coal power plant with a molten salt TES with lithium ion batteries or PEM electrolyzers was evaluated and it was found that the cost of integration increases with increasing power energy capacity of storage system, and it could be high. Pairing a coal power plant with TES is the cheapest of the three options. Hybridizing lithium batteries and a coal power plant require a substantially high capital investment than that of coal power TES and the coal power electrolyzer integration. Lithium ion batteries and the water electrolyzers also have higher reinvestment cost due to the need to replace cells that degrade. Obviously, R&D is needed to continue improving commercially available technologies and reducing the cost and potentially make breakthroughs in emerging technologies. Models should be established to assess the market value, risks, and the benefits of various integration solutions. For those of you who might be interested, more detailed techno-economic comparisons can be found in my report, which is currently on the peer review. People from our member countries can download the draft, the draft report from our website. Any comments, suggestions, and additional information are welcome and will be highly appreciated. Now, the key findings. The demand for a more flexible and a dynamic grid driven by the rapid expansion of renewable power has led to a significant increase in grid scale energy storage deployment and the research and development of new or better storage technology solutions. Integrating energy storage into a coal power plant can potentially enhance the flexibility of the asset and the overall overall system efficiency, as well as improve plant economics. Technically, it is feasible to integrate thermal energy storage, batteries, and the water electrolyzers with coal power plants. 
but more R&D is needed. Each integration solution provide, but provides flexibility in different ways, and it usually requires large investment. Techno-economical assessment should be conducted to evaluate the advantages and the disadvantages and the economic viability of various integration solutions. So that's the end of my presentation and thank you for listening. Now, see if we have any questions here. Yeah, we do have quite a few. With the presentation or with the presentation or record will be available. Oh yes, it will be available and it's also available on YouTube. So you can watch it at any time. Um, right, there's the next one. This has been an excellent overview of energy storage technologies. Are you planning to issue a report on this topic? Will the slides from this presentation be available from download? Yes, this, this uh, webinar is actually based on um, my, my report, which is on the peer review at the moment and uh, is probably will be published in August. And the slides can be, is, are available to download from our website. Uh, the next. For thermal energy storage, have you also investigated the production and the storage of ice? I have seen this used in the USA for cooling in, in the inlet air of gas turbine. Uh, well, no, because um, for thermal energy storage to be integrated with you know, in, in in the water steam loop of the power generation, the the ice production is not suited for for this purpose. So haven't looked into this. What's the next? What is the expected rise of electricity cost with hybrid technologies? The, the cost is high, but there is some uh, analysis carried out for the integration of thermal energy storage with coal power generation. And uh, because the, um, the, the the power plant can enter this, uh, can sell the um, the electricity at during the uh, peak time at higher price and the store the store the energy, the electricity when the uh, demand is low and the price is low. So in this uh, arbitrage market, the um, analysis shows there is some uh, financial gain by the integration, the uh, thermal energy storage with power plants. But I haven't seen the, you know, the analysis or for, for the other inti integration solutions. So I can't, I can't answer for that, but the, 
the uh, cost is quite high for integration of coal power with batteries. So it's quite expensive. So probably it's currently not economically viable. Uh, right, excellent presentation. Are there any commercially application of thermal energy storage? There are applications of thermal energy storage currently all use are all use the renewable energy to you know in in like solo thermal power power, uh, power plants and uh, some some projects are under development in Germany they convert the unused disused coal power plants use the uh, equipment to store the uh, renewable power in the thermal in the form of thermal energy and uh, use that to generate electricity when the demand is high um, but because uh, you know, in 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 the in most OECD countries, the coal power plants are under pressure to close, so we haven't seen any projects in integrating the thermal power uh, thermal energy storage system with coal power plants for for this application. Uh, recall the available in China. Yeah, I, I think yes. If you you have registered, uh, whether you in register or not, I think if you you can log on to our website, uh, you know the webinar, then you can download the recorder, the recorded webinar. Yes, I think so. Uh, what's the next? Thank you for the informative presentation. Could you please kindly elaborate briefly the national policy incentives, such as those in the US, China, to deploy energy? Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't. I haven't looked into the policy side of of this. I don't know what what policy, national policy incentive for what for for energy storage or something. I don't quite understand this question. Sorry. But anyway, I haven't looked at the uh, policies. In, in, in this study, I just uh, look at the technologies which are suitable for integration with coal power plants. Uh, another question here says, can this be related to carbon storage in unmineable coal beds? Um, well, this is this. My study is not about carbon storage. It's it's about you know the store energy storage technologies which are suitable to be integrated in coal power plants. So I haven't looked at the uh, you know the uh, its relation to the carbon storage right uh let me see if there is any more
Could you explain eco-friendly statement of lithium-ion batteries? <laughs> well, I'm not looking at the um, this this study is not about how the um, energy system energy storage system is produced. It's only about you know what it if it's a commercial is if it's available what it can what it can do and what the advantages and disadvantages and if it's suitable for integration with coal power plants but for their <clears throat> production if it's eco-friendly or not is an out of scope of this study right i think it's about time and we need to wrap up that's all we have yeah. time for today thank you so much um and all, all that's left for me to say is the report on this topic will be published in september and the slides from the webinar as you've already mentioned are available from our website on the webinar page and also the recording will be available from my youtube channel later today the next webinar from us will be in july thank you all for joining us today and good luck